Okay. We can start? Yes. <laughs> Welcome everyone here. We can barely see you because it's a dark room. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you are also wearing black as well. Yes. <laughs> and it's welcome. a theme tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And Shlonish <laughs> Manur. Yeah. Welcome everyone from the internet as well who is watching us. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Saud. <laughs> uh, it is an absolute honor to be talking to you. Um, yeah, where do we begin? Where do we begin? Maybe with the beginning, Black Genesis. You might know that Genesis, uh, the story of Genesis is very important to me. Uh, my son is named Adam, after all. Uh, and yeah, it's a very central part of yeah, the Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Islam shares a lot of those traditions, uh, but there's always a little bit extra Yes. Some details <laughs> that uh, yeah, the third child in a family uh, <laughs> comes up with. Yes. <laughs> and the extra in the story of Genesis that we have from Islam is that um, when Abraham, the story of Abraham and Ishmael mm -hmm. and Hajar, mm -hmm. in the Bible, he leaves them in the desert uh, and God promises him, promises that, uh, Abraham that they will be taken care of. Uh, and the extra in the Islamic version is that he left them with a meteor, with a rock, mm -hmm. uh, that came down with Adam and Eve, yes. yeah, supposedly. And this is the cornerstone of the cube-shaped structure in Mecca, mm -hmm. the direction Muslims pray uh, five times a day. And I wanted to ask you a question within this context of yes. Black Genesis. What is holy? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, it's dark Genesis, by the way. <laughs> um, my idea was the, that there has to be also um, new creations, new worlds, uh, new portals uh, with which to enter a parallel universe, which is why I called it dark Genesis and that the pearl itself was um, a catalyst for this uh, new world, a world we don't understand, uh, a magical world, um, a supernatural world. Um, and I felt like in this, in this moment that we are living now, um, there is something that ended somehow, a way of life that ended and that we must find a, a new path. And so it's a kind of metaphorical use of, of the word Genesis. So it's not exactly holy, <laughs> but uh, for me, uh, anything magical or, or supernatural or ancient actually has this holy, let's say, aura to it. And uh, I just find it immensely inspirational, be it a meteor in the desert or uh, a story from another time. Uh, I'm very much obsessed with things that happened in the past. I'm not a forward-looking artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the, the things from the past always mutate no, the, in my The work. new past, yes, yeah, exactly. as you phrased it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So everything mutates in my work. So even if I reference the past, it becomes something mutant. But yeah. <laughs> would you also say you're connecting the mythical with the physical, with these objects that you're recreating as well? Um, yes. Um, I don't know. I just find that uh, because so much kind of magical thinking has been lost in contemporary times that... Um, you know, once you're exposed to it, somehow, uh, if it's in a controlled certain context, people are open to that. They just don't tap into it anymore. Um, I think there is an innate um, kind of desire for magic in our lives, um, which is kind of what I want to create with this work, um, Holy Quarter. I'm going to shift gears a little bit to be biographical and then I'm going to go back to the work, but okay. 
what are the tensions you feel between the different cultural backgrounds that make up your body of work, mm -hmm. your artist spirit, as it were, you know, Japan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Beirut, uh, uh, besides, of course, Kuwait. Yeah. And yeah, like, uh, uh, explain to me how these different tension points work. Yeah, I mean, I was born in Senegal, I grew up in Kuwait. When I was 16, I moved to Japan to study, and then I stayed there for 10 years, and after that, Beirut, Amsterdam, and now Berlin. So I have this, people like to kind of, uh, you know, use the euphemism of hybrid, or, but I, I really like to use the, the real word, which is a mutant. <laughs> I am a mutant and uh, I really culturally don't belong anywhere, which uh, gives me this weird sense of freedom because I'm an alien wherever I go. But um, obviously my Arab background is huge in my upbringing and my thought process and also all my traumas growing up. <laughs> and uh, the Japanese influence is, is there visually, aesthetically, uh, mentally, and um, I'm also trying to get rid of it somehow, but I can't. <laughs> this, my life is a cartoon somehow. <laughs> and kind of following that, but in a different way, deep beneath the ground, mm -hmm. outer space, mm -hmm. the desert, mm -hmm. the sea, the distant human past, the even older dinosaur past, mm -hmm. these are the mental spaces your work goes to. Where does your Arab, where does your artist uh, spirit rest? I mean, I grew up in the desert, which is Kuwait, and it just felt natural that there is no nature. And Kuwait is also not a beautiful desert. It's not like dunes and things. It's very flat and almost depressing. And I, um, any kind of like vegetation is always foreign to me, <laughs> like uh, encountering flowers. What are flowers for? <laughs> I always have this strange feeling when I'm dealing with these things. I'm also, they're almost like props from a cartoon that I don't know anything about. So, uh, but all of these, the sea and the desert especially have very deep also biographical relationships to me as a person. Because my grandfather was a singer on a pearl diving boat, Naham. And uh, I just fantasize about his life all the time because it seems so foreign to me even though it's only two generations ago that he existed. Uh, I just think, you know, what, how did that life work? Is it even real? I always doubt that it was, it's some kind, of, some kind of fiction that was made up in a government advertising agency. <laughs> because that's how they promote it to us, that, you know, oh, pearl diving, yay, it's amazing, and the songs and the boats, and so romantic. And, but actually it was a very harsh, difficult life, full of disease and, and death and alienation. Um, so I just imagine it so much all the time. And also my great-grandmother, uh, Munira, who I'm named after, so I always think about her. <laughs> um, she, was, uh, she got lost in the desert when she was 13 in Saudi Arabia. And a passing caravan brought her to Kuwait. So she survived death. And I'm always also imagining her life and uh, how did this happen? So these two things are always pulling me in. And like I said, I'm obsessed with the past. So it's past ancient people. I'm trying to imagine their life, basically. <laughs> yeah. Now, a little more kind of uh, about practice. Mm -hmm. Take us to Munir Al-Qadiri in the studio, open canvas. <laughs> uh, uh, you can go anywhere. Where do you go? I mean, usually it starts with like a random inspiration, a film or music or sound or a thought that came up in a dream or 
For me, it's not a, a, a structured process. It's very chaotic. There's a spiritual kind of practice, right? True. It's all okay. about yeah. like mental space and uh, this kind of gestation period that it's like a, something growing in your mind and it takes over. So yeah, I don't really have a structured process per se. It's really every time the project is different and how it works is different. And there are obviously big failures <laughs> and not so big failures. <laughs> And this project I don't consider a failure, no. so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you, you let random impulses, uh, you, yes. you accept them, and you yes. take risks, yeah? Yeah. You, you know. mm. uh, I don't think I've, yeah, like in Kuwait, the number of different genres and, and uh, situations from performances oh. to film and, and so forth. Um, and yeah, I guess this is the real kind of crux that there is a continuity within the diversity of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and your attraction to religious topics is, um, yeah, <laughs> as the microphone is <laughs> breaking up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in religion as an art form because it's continued so long and so many cultures and rituals grew around it and kind of gathered in that space mentally that I really feel it's, it's uh, an art form that we don't look at as art. And I find that really sad because it's so diverse and beautiful and, and also uh, so misunderstood and also miscommunicated. So different countries have completely different interpretations of the same text or the same uh, ritual even and uh, I was born in Senegal which is predominantly Muslim country and I left six months after I was born so I don't have any memory of it but I went back in 2017 for a project and I just you know their interpretation of Islam was so new and different and and really distinct to me that I, I just I love how it's it's like that and we just always try to think of religion as a kind of monolith when it isn't it's so diverse and so big and so interesting um so yeah i, I really look at it as an artist in arabic uh, we have this concept called al mm -hmm. which is the unknown and this is kind of uh, allah's domain mm -hmm. is al ghayb that no one knows the unknown except god yeah mm -hmm. And, of course, even within the diversity of interpreting, basically, what humans cannot possibly know <laughs> yeah, is kind of very diverse. And I think your work is kind of a discourse on exploring yes. the unknown. And your combination of sort of Harry St. John Philby, historical figures, historical <laughs> pictures, and a along with kind of your speculation on, yeah, if the black rock came from the same crater as uh, the one in Oman or doesn't, you know, this is the, the technical, yes. yeah, yeah, the technical scientific yeah. side. It doesn't even really matter, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day. So fiction and, and uh, between reality fiction, the, uh, history, not really history, um, yeah, uh, everything is malleable and flexible, I think. Um, Another thing is that I wanted to say about um, kind of magical or almost pseudo-religious thinking is um, I just also think that the way in the Gulf, especially we deal with oil and oil wealth, we deal with it in a very kind of distant, almost like it's a metaphysical uh, being, like a magic potion that makes everybody wealthy and is given to us from you know a holy place and that we're the chosen people somehow so there is also with new and contemporary ideas and uh, shifts in economy and, and society that people um, attribute these magical ideas to a thing that just is randomly there and you know some dinosaurs died there millions of years ago and they turned into this oil and, oh, amazing, we found it. We are the chosen people. <laughs> the way it goes from cause you know, to effect is a bit strange. <laughs> 
And nobody really approaches the subject in where we and live. And, and if you actually know it, is it really a blessing when you have to, you know, maintain huge mansions and, yes. you know, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a miracle and a curse. I mean, it's also, this is a big part of my work is that this, it's a, it's a curse. Like the, really like this, uh, you know, uh, story about the people of Ad and the madness of decadence and pleasure and indulgence that they were living in is very much similar to, <laughs> you know, what's happening in Dubai or, you know. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah. were the suburbs of Babylon at one point. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the recurring themes of uh, civilizations dying in decadence. Mm -hmm. But of course, like uh, the oil wealth, wealthy states didn't really have to build empires. Mm -hmm. It was just the realities of like, the geopolitical order and mm -hmm. uh, energy politics yeah, at exactly. the end of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, lots of deep themes here. <laughs> <laughs> But I, yeah, I also want to say that it's, um, you know, it's, it's fleeting also. All of this is, uh, I mean, if the oil market collapses tomorrow, so many things will collapse and will never be the same again. And nobody, you know, they're almost like living on a magic carpet and they're not looking at the ground, you know, it's, uh, you're going to crash. <laughs> it's not really flying, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, we discussed like... Um, you sometimes feel a lot of pressure in Kuwait mm -hmm. uh, to fit their kind of imagination of uh, what an artist should do in the current contemporary moment and yeah. uh, present your work in malls, for instance, because you know exactly. shopping malls is a big. Yeah, that's uh, exactly <laughs> what people tell me all the time. <laughs> Why don't you show it in the mall? More people will see it. And it's just like this, you know, obviously this capitalism hybrid with monarchies. It's just a bizarre thing that ended in. Shopping malls. Yeah, no, no. It's like uh, I, just, I don't understand it anymore. Yeah, it's like inviting a quartet to come play on the Titanic, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it's just a, a sinking ship, and I have very dark feelings about the whole region. And uh, unfortunately, my work and my yeah my preoccupation is really about tragedy and yeah. tragic subjects and. My, yeah, my thesis is called The Aesthetics of Sadness, so <laughs> I'm always looking at this thing and it's tragic. There's no, nothing positive about uh, it. Aren't, aren't you guys happy that this is the first <laughs> thing we do after <laughs> Corona, right? Yeah. You're good. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I think this is also another kind of point. Maybe the rest of the world is catching up to the darkness that we have in the Middle East. I know. Yeah, in some <laughs> ways we have like some experience uh, beforehand. Uh, yeah, beforehand of yeah, what civil wars can do. What, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and who knows what's going to happen in the world now, how it's going to be shaped two or three years from now. I, I can't see it. I mean, I, I had such an artist block since it happened, and uh, this is the kind of the first thing that I tried to work through, but my head was really like, my brain was like mud, you know? Like, how can you see what will happen even a month or two from now? So this is why I was really trying to focus on this fortune telling aspect we need fortune tellers now there, there's some prophetic uh, <laughs> prophetic lines uh, and you you, you, you you know you couldn't have written it better uh, uh that it happened before corona i mean it's yeah. bizarre i wrote about <laughs> the century. great disease in october it's, i just felt like a soothsayer <laughs> and also the the big drill sculpture you will see inside i made it in 2014 in november in dubai and then Two weeks later, the oil market crashed, and it's a giant oil drill, basically, and, and it was kind of a warning that, you know, this is not going to last forever. And, you know, I just find it interesting sometimes that artists have this, uh, you know, <laughs> Maybe you guys head of a fortune teller yeah. sometimes, and I... I You're our secular pro uh, prophets, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly, maybe. So I just find it interesting that, you know, maybe this is a thing, you know, like maybe we should use this more and try to tap into the supernatural world, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Tr it's truly sometimes, yeah, uh, to look at your work is really to marvel at the wonder of human ingenuity at dealing, yeah, with like the mythical uh, uh, yeah, and the spiritual. So, uh, I mean, it's changing all the time. It's not always been about this, but there is a kind of uh, a thread, let's say, about fascination with certain themes like mythology and religion and 
if gender even and uh, yeah the the poem that was uh, in the middle of the performance was um, I read it I changed the pitch of my voice to sound like a man and this is something I do a lot <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of drag in my work but I mean, here it's a bit behind the scenes I know even that example it's a first person account yes of a meteor yes done in a Yemeni poetic style yeah, yeah. in 1855 I think it was oh, okay. it's amazing how poetry is like a, an archive of of the history of the region you know sure. there's so much so the problem is that we really have very I think few like kind of um, individual written accounts like these British explorers there's so many of them and it's it's sad that we always have to go back to these texts to kind of create a realistic image of what life was like at that time uh, and because poetry is so vague and diverse and can be interpreted in so many different ways um, I, I can't use it as this kind of image maker but at the same time it's the archive of the history of the entire region mm. and it's the preeminent art form yes of exactly course, uh, yeah of the Arabs that the, the textuality and well at least the word mm. it was oral before it was text uh, but another interesting kind of connection point for poetry and the Kaaba the, mm -hmm. the, the cube in Mecca uh, was in pre-islamic times the only thing they would hang off the Kaaba was the great poet poems yes uh, the exactly. Mu'alaqat mu yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. Antar bin Shaddad and, and so forth Amr al -Qais. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, in a way, yeah, you, yeah. you, you are in a, in a sense like a poetic artist, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, uh, maybe, but uh, yeah, I just think it's, uh, I'm, I've, I'm fascinated by poetry and, and it's, it's, also, it's really, an, you know, uh, art. It's not, uh, you know, in, in, in Arabic poetry, I think, and literature, it's really like the audio-visual elements are all inside the text. So you don't need the images, and uh, that's kind of the beauty of kind of Islamic thought for me is that it's um, you know it, the visuals are always in your mind, and I could never get to that level, unfortunately, because probably I lived in Japan for so long, and Japan is a hyper visual society, so that just probably got into me, and I I could never reach this. Uh, you know, mindset of this kind of the visuals are only in my mind and I don't need them anymore. <laughs> I love that. I, as an artist, of course, it, it's uh, contrary to what I should do. <laughs> but I admire it so much. No, but you know, it's, it's a resource, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I kind of want to be selfish and keep asking Munira more questions, but. Uh, I think it's only fair to share. Uh, if I think due to Corona, we are not allowed to give you a microphone and directly ask questions. If you would stand up uh, and say your question loudly, um, I don't know if someone can help me pick, because yeah, the lights as well, it's pretty hard. And then I'll repeat the question for the internet, uh, as it were. So if someone raises their hand or stands up, if I can see. Come on, someone brave. <laughs> ah, please stand up. So uh, when you told the story about the people of Ba'a, uh -huh. and you showed this uh, 3D, sort of low poly 3D yes. section, uh, how come you picked this uh, representation? So, um, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, it, so the question was, why did you choose the low res 3D representations of Ad? Uh, yeah. Very good question. Um, growing up um, in the Arab context, Muslim context, it was always um, kind of against the norms to act out certain uh, historical or ancient or religious um, stories. Um, so I think beginning in the 90s, uh, they started using these very cheap looking uh, 3D animations to animate these kind of, let's say, Quranic stories. 
And I always found them fascinating because the characters are always kind of, I think they are pre-made, they're not, uh, they're not uh, original, so one of them looks like Zeus or uh, you know, uh, some other mythical character and, and they try to y use this very uh, cheap yeah, animation to create these um, stories and I, I really love them, I just find them so strange and um, I inhuman and they can never give a, a realism to the story. So that's why I used it. And yeah, I think it's also not fair that one of my students is the only person who asked the question, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. Hmm? No. no? Have, have you seen the uh, Ausstellung? Have you actually seen Empty Quarter? I'm sure a lot of you guys have, right? Yeah. Holy Quarter. Holy Quarter, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess that will be the end. Yes. Shukran. <laughs> <laughs>